Welcome to our sneak peek program. The new ex this is the first of our summer exhibits to open, the first of three, so we're really excited. This one is called Grand Teton National Park, painting the park from Thomas Moran to today. And it comprises two exhibit spaces. Adam will be giving a bit of an overview in just a minute. It's in our current space, which is uh, Changing Visions Gallery, and it's also in the Gilcrease Gallery adjacent to, to my right. The exhibit officially opens, I guess, tonight with our mixed media program. Be sure to come back for that. It's a really fun program, it, and Amy might want to give a quick little thing. goes from 6 to 9 tonight. Yep. Music, so, food. Music, good food, good drinks, some activities. Um, Superintendent David Vela will be here speaking at 7.30. He's always really amazing to listen to. So we're just excited to celebrate both this exhibit and our relationship with the park. Very good. Thanks, Amy. Uh, it will remain open, this exhibit, through September 5th. So come back, bring your friends, bring your relatives. It's a great opportunity to check out some fabulous art. If you don't know me, I'm Jane Lovino, and I'm the Curator of Education and Exhibits here at the museum. The, let's see, what else I want to say to you? Oh, you may notice since it officially opens tonight, and most people who are looking at the calendar won't be coming until tomorrow, to see this exhibit, you should know that when we do these sneak peeks, there are a few things that aren't quite finished yet, and that's to be expected. Sometimes it's the light, sometimes the lighting is not, sometimes not quite finished. Um, as you'll see, there are some ladders in our adjacent room here. There's some educational elements that are pretty close to being finished, but a couple little things that still need to be um, programmed and so forth. But um, it's, we find that people really enjoy the opportunity to come behind the scenes and get a sneak peek before anybody else is able to come in. So after this the program ends at about noon, it's a short program, about half an hour, we will be closing the doors so we can finish up. But you can, you know, make sure you check it out, and then after you're done, we'll close the doors, and it won't open again until tonight at 6 p.m. Right. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to mention, come on in. Last thing I want to mention is that we're very grateful to all of our summer exhibit sponsors, including Peregrine Capital Management. Adam Harris, our Peterson Curator of Art and Research, is now going to talk a bit about an overview of the exhibit, um, and including the, you know, what, how it's organized and things like that. And when Adam is finished, we have a very special guest. Catherine Turner, who is an artist uh, in this exhibition, will be speaking after Adam. And I'll give her a brief introduction right before she speaks. Okay, Thanks, great. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, well, let's start. We'll come on in here. Watch out for the ladders. We're going to look at first the most historic pieces in this exhibit are six works by Thomas Moran, um, who is one of the first artists to paint the Tetons. We're really lucky to have these works, two from private collections and four from Grand Teton Collection. And I saw Bridget back there somewhere. Bridget Guild is the curator of Grand Teton National Park Collection, and so we want to say a big thanks to her for lending us these four. And then there are four other works in the exhibit on loan from the Park Collection, and so it's a great collaboration between the two organizations, um, and having those pieces really has helped us out, uh, helped us fill out our different visions of um, of the park and different visions of the peaks. So these paintings by Thomas Moran are from, a, uh, the watercolors are from a trip he took here in 1879. The oil paintings that you see are studio uh, works that he did later in life. Um, but Thomas Moran was lucky enough to see the Tetons after Mount Moran had been named after him. So that's sort of a rare event. And these two paintings are of Mount Moran by Thomas Moran. So that is a really cool thing. They're all from the Idaho side. You could, he couldn't come over to this side, um, which was true of many artists until, um, really until the 1900s. You don't see a lot of people being able to come over to Jackson Hole and paint this side of the Tetons. Um, so the two, you know, two historic pieces from uh, this side of the Tetons by John Ferry and Charles Partridge Adams, it's not really until you get to the, after World War II in the 1950s, that Jackson really takes off as a tourist uh, destination, as a place that's promoting visitorship. At the same time, you get more visitors to this side of the Tetons. 
you get more Teton paintings. So it kind of all makes sense. So what you see in this room are uh, three works by Conrad Schwering, who really helped cement uh, painting the park, painting the Tetons. Um, and then all these great people that came after him. There are wonderful works in here by Greg McCuron, um, and also by uh, Bill Sachuk. Bill Sachuk's still active uh, and painting with Kathy Turner down in Trio Gallery. So that's this room. A brief overview will go in here. Um, recent acquisitions out. Uh, things that people haven't seen in a while or ever. Um, and so we're really excited to have this piece by Tucker Smith here. And there's Tucker and Gene right there. Thank you for coming. Um, this was in a private collection up until about last year. And then it, it came to us. And it is a moose in uh, Cascade Canyon. We're really excited to have it here. There's two other nice studies by Tucker next to it. And then a great painting of uh, Mount Moran and Elk in the corner over there. They are flanking this wonderful work by Catherine Turner that we uh, purchased last year and that was in Monarchs of the Plains, the exhibit that we just had. And we liked it so much we decided to transfer it over here. It makes a great point. And it has a lot to do with how people perceive the park and their experiences of it. So we're really excited to have that. This work by John Banovich is also a recent gift. Um, and he, I talked to him last summer, and he told me that these were moose that he saw outside of Jackson Lake Lodge. So that's a great, uh, great combo right there. Um, we brought out this Robert Bateman, Rocky Wilderness yeah, Cougar, which hasn't been out in a long time. I know it's a visitor favorite. Not necessarily painted uh, here, but it could be painted here. So um, we didn't keep the rules too strict. Uh, we've got the Trustees Purchase Award from Western Visions last year, um, right there, called um, Windfall by Rox Corbett, which is a beautiful graphite work. Um, and I thought that was a really nice compliment to this great bear painting over here by Ann Coe, who, um, and this is another recent gift that we were uh, recently given. So again, an opportunity to bring some wonderful items from the collection out on view that haven't been seen before. And then one of the most dramatic pieces that we've got is Travis Walker's uh, paraglider painting that we borrowed from a local private collection. So we wanted to show a variety of ways that people have experienced the park and these mountains from Thomas Moran to today. And I think in these two galleries we've managed to span, what, uh, 150 or so years of uh, painting the park. Um, so we're really excited to have this breadth of material here. We're also really excited to have this wonderful um, interpretive station with Catherine Turner. And so, Jane, do you sure. want to yes, introduce I will. Catherine and be before we jump to Catherine, I'm just going to point out a couple of the educational elements. One is this table here. There's a puzzle, and there are six images because it's a cube puzzle, and cubes have six sides. There are six images. All of them uh, are in this room. One of them is Tucker Smith's moose that you see straight over there. Uh, the one that you see right side up is the co-painting that you see over in that corner. So our goal with that is to get people looking closely at the paintings as they complete the puzzle. And then the other major interpretive station, um, well, I should mention, there are some things out on the table over in, in the first room we were in. And there we have uh, uh, four different stereoscope viewers. He, Tourists to the parks love to collect memories and bring them back and remember their wonderful experiences, vacations in the parks. And a stereoscope from the early 1900s. And we have a Viewmaster, which is a similar idea, but a little bit more modern technology next to that. And then a pair of 3D glasses and a book of wildlife of the parks next to that. There are all interesting bits of information out there you can play with. Um, and then the major interpretive station is right over here in this corner, and it's a plein air painting simulation. And Catherine Turner, who is about to, to join us and, and tell us some, some insight into her work and into this station as well, um, she's the artist whose painting is featured here. So what you're looking at is a time lapse, <coughs> a view of the Tetons from Triangle X Ranch, which is within Grand Teton National Park. 
And then, so you see two hours of time condensed in this time lapse. And then simultaneously, um, Apri Visuals, who helped us with the filming, was filming Catherine Turner as she created a painting of that scene. <coughs> so what you see on the screen of the artist's easel is two hours of painting time from painting start to finish, pretty much, condensed to two minutes. But it really, what we wanted to do is create the feeling of an artist in residence. The next best thing to having an artist in residence here all the time, it's meant to give the effect of an artist who stepped away from their canvas, and you get some real good insight into the, the process of creating a painting. Additionally, there's another screen across from the easel that has an audio piece, we call it Chat with the Artist, and we, Catherine again was kind enough to spend some time with us and we asked her, what are the most common things that people ask you? If you're out painting in the field and you're in a place where people are stopping by, what do they ask you? So you'll see there uh, nine different questions ranging from why do you like to paint outside to what are some of the challenges to painting outside to uh, you know, what, there's a joke in there even if you look close enough about what does one plein air painter say, you know, what is the, what is it, Carrie, what is the... How, how many plein air painters does it take to complete a painting? There you go. <laughs> and Catherine can answer that for us, or you can hear her answer it on the audio piece. But like I, like I said earlier, you know, the, all the, you know, this will be all up as part of the exhibit. It's not just today. You have plenty of time to explore. Catherine is going to speak next. And she not only agreed to work with us on this plein air painting station, which we're really excited about, but she created a piece behind Jennifer called Three Matriarchs, over here, the large piece straight across from me. And her finished piece for the plein air, from the plein air painting session is right above your head over here. And so you can see the finished work of art over there, which is hers as well. So she, Catherine has a long history with this museum. She has a long history with this valley. She grew up in this valley on Triangle X Ranch in Grand Teton National Park. And she came to this museum in its very early days when she was a teenager at Jackson Hole High School. When we were just, the museum was first starting its educational programs. She visited the museum as part of the museum's education program. She uh, was an art teacher for a while. She studied art in Washington, D.C. and other places. She also um, worked for our museum. She was uh, in our education department and she did a lot of the online uh, education that appears on our website. And now she's a full-time painter and she has her work in Trio Gallery, just north of town as you're heading up to the museum. And we are delighted that she's agreed to be with us today and talk about her work, a little bit about other artists maybe in the collection, about plein air painting, Catherine, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe a, a, another round of applause for the museum, the museum staff, for putting all this together. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm really touched as I look around the room. This is wonderful. I'm really grateful to look and see all these faces of family and friends. Um, I'm really grateful. Gratefully, you take some time out today to spend some time with art um, here at this museum, this beautiful museum. I feel like I have had a charmed life, which I have, by being able to be born and raised in Grand Teton National Park at the ranch. Um, then, soon thereafter, I bumped into this fellow who would love to come to the ranch. He would drive his red Jeep up because he loved the view. And that was Conrad Schwering, and he was a good friend of our families, and he loved the view from the ranch. And I, I, I was tiny, tiny, and I would sit in the sagebrush, and I would get to watch him with his magnificent canvases and his big, juicy palette. I would get to see him render the mountains on location in real time. It made the biggest impression in my life to watch that. I probably took it for granted and I ask a lot of, of those bad questions <laughs> as he's trying to paint. Um, but he was very gracious and he was really generous with his time that he would um, that he would he would let me hang out with him and watch him paint. Um, Conrad Schwering, as 
a lot of you know, has probably been one of the most influential landscape painters that came in the early times to Jackson. He was a master painter um, and was passionate about this place. Before he even had much of an audience, he painted it because it, it, it called to him. And that's really why we all paint. Tucker would agree that it's, it's, a, it's a calling that we can't resist, but it's a very intimidating subject matter. And that um, I had no idea <laughs> how tricky it would be to do this, this part justice. What I've really been blessed with is I've had a lot of great teachers, Tucker being one of them, um, that have helped me um, learn a, a little tiny bit about what it means to, to, to document and render this place. Another wonderful influence for me was our, our late friend, Greg McCurron. And I went and he does such a beautiful job with the Tetons. He too would do these massive paintings on location. And he'd have to rope them down with, you know, to, and tie them to his van so that they wouldn't blow away. Um, they were so big, they were like a sail. So I said to him, I said, will you, will you help me learn to paint the Tetons? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, you're not ready to paint the Tetons. And I said, well, what's it going to take for me to be ready? He said, you have to draw them a hundred times before I'll talk to you again. If you know Greg, you won't be surprised. It's something like that. But he had, he, it was, um, it was great advice because there are no shortcuts to learning how to do anything. There's no shortcuts to learning how to paint the Tetons, and they're, um, they're, they are, they are a challenge. What he wanted me to do is he wanted me to understand them on a deeper level, understand their, the, the, the architecture of the different peaks and how, how the, the shapes of the glaciers and, and get them from every angle and the perspective and the ridge lines and know them intimately. And I had to bring back my hundred drawings before he would take me to the next step. Um, having grown up in this valley and seeing the mountains every day, I feel like they are different mountains every day, depend, depending on the weather, depending on the snow line, depending on the, the time of day and the light, the way that it's hitting each of those plains of each of those peaks. So I'm really grateful that he slowed me down and made me do the work. Um, I still need to do an, another hundred drawings before I feel like I am beginning to understand them. The other thing that Tucker has done for me is he's made me go into those mountains and walk in those peaks and understand them as an artist viscerally. And so we've had uh, we had a wonderful trip in the Wind River Mountains last summer or a couple summers ago that changed my. We were following the footsteps of Carl Rungus, and I couldn't have gone with anyone better than Tucker because he knows the winds and he knows Rungus. And so for a young artists like myself, it was a really, it was a, a, a dear privilege that I treasure, so thank you. Um, so, so we, the best way to paint the mountains is to paint them on location. What is amazing about this installation that they've done is that you get to stand there and pretend that's the landscape and that you're in it, and you really get a sense of how it continues to change. The light continued, the, the clouds continue to roll, they continue to move, and the landscape, the light will come and go as the, as the sun is filtered. And so these wonderful people <laughs> have tried to distill it down, to, 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 to extil, distill the process down. And for me, as an artist, I feel like I will never fully arrive, I will never master these mountains. What's most important is that I fall in love with the process of trying. And that's why I'm so grateful that they created an opportunity for you to experience that process. That's what's so compelling about being an artist, or maybe about anything that we love to do, is really just enjoy the process. So um, I'm grateful that you came to see the paintings of the park. And this particular piece, I really salute you. It's been a blast to work on this project with you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. So if this is a great time for you either to answer, ask questions of Catherine or of Adam. Um, go for it. 
did the museum have any John Clymer paintings of Teton Park? And are they in the show? Or is it? We have um, two that are studies that are in the studio installation. Yes, they are. So then that's really it from Clymer in terms of the Tetons. He didn't paint the Tetons much. Yeah. He, he consciously stayed away from painting the Tetons. Oh, I didn't know that. But there, we are going to have, I think, a scavenger hunt for people to go into the other parts of the museum and try to find Teton paintings. Because we have one by Rungus when he came through. We have two by Clymer, maybe in the Clymer studio, and then there's a couple spread out in other places. afraid it would overwhelm the painting he was trying to do. And, and that's what the Tetons do. I mean, yeah. Um, They're their own subject. They live here and not. But, but well, I like in this one of Mount Moran, you've really uh, atmospherically blended the, you know, Mount Moran into the background. Yeah, um, true. So that your focus is on the elk. So you're not, it's not a painting of the Tetons with the elk. The, you know, it's a painting of elk and the two hunger back there. And the same is true of this painting by Catherine, where you're not even seeing the Tetons, even though you know you're right down in there and the Tetons are back there somewhere. I get a lot of people ask, why, why continue painting the Tetons? Because they've been painted before. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been painted beautifully. Uh, Jim Wilcox has painted them how many times, and he's nailed them. <laughs> you know, like, so why go there again? Um, and I, my answer is, is because we can't not. They're, they're confronting us all day, every day. So you have to confront them. And um, I think that what's the challenge now is to paint them, do them justice, but not um, make them trite, make them our own give them our own um, artistic voice, our, uh, uh, something. And Tucker's solution for that was to soften them. Um, there's, so, it, I don't know, why do you paint the Tetons? What, the, what would be um, your answer to that? I generally don't paint the Tetons either, <laughs> but just what you said, that yeah. they've done, been done a number of times, they've done well. Um, they're so recognizable that as soon as you put them in a painting, that takes over. That's, that's it. And that might not be what you're trying to say. Um, on the refuge painting of mine, I put a cloud on Sleeping Indian for the same reason. I didn't want the same Sleeping Indian to take over the painting. Um, so it's compositional. You know, they're so dramatic that you can't get away from them. Yeah, you can see like these three, just looking at these three paintings in that part of the room, people uh, take doing different takes on the Tetons and working them in and coming up with different solutions to do them in a new way. You can always just paint the Tetons, uh, like from the Overlook, Sankara Overlook. We've got two great works in there that I didn't mention. One, the classic photograph by Ansel Adams of that place. And then Conrad Schwering's take on that same kind of place, which is really interesting to compare. Um, so if you don't want to just do that, you can do, you know, all these different things that these folks have done over here. They have T.D. Mayhew, who painted an osprey, osprey nest, nest um, called Room with a View, that gets you to think about the Grand Teton in a little bit different way. And then I love this one um, by Travis Walker of looking at the whole valley and incorporating our own recreational activities into um, what draws a lot of us here to Jackson Hole, all the things that you can do. Um, and also, if you've been to the top of Snow King, it's just such a fantastic way to experience the valley. Um, and then this just super humorous uh, piece by Annie Co, um, of a picnic that's gone awry. Uh, 
with, I, I can't ever tell if it's the bears that were having the picnic or if it were people that were having the picnic and then the bears and the ravens came and disrupted them. But it's a nice way to incorporate Oxbow Bend, Mount Moran into yet another uh, scenario. I have a sort of an answer. Yes, okay. Good. When one looks at a view, one can look at it as a realist. One can look at it as an expressionist. One can look at it as a poet. And it's where does it hit you in your body from any way that you might look at it. And I find after years and years and years of coming and going to Jackson, every time I look at the mountains, my eyes burst with tears and my body fills with joy. So that's why we keep having those mountains painted. <laughs> it's not a bowl of fruit, it's the tea tots. <laughs> Thank you for doing what you do. <laughs>
grown enough as an artist to be able to reconcile some of the things that needed to be done. Um, it's got more layers than you would probably guess. It has, uh, there, to do a piece like this, I, I put layers and layers and layers. Of, and you have to let each layer dry. This is a studio piece. Um, and you have the privilege in the studio to extend the time out as you need. But the field studies on location are essential, in my opinion, to learning the essence of light, the perspective, the form, the nuances of the landscape. Those are really important, even if nobody sees them. Um, those are, those are, the field studies, first and foremost, should be for the artist's learning experience. I think the best answer I've heard, and I've heard several artists give this answer when someone says, how long did that take? They say, a lifetime. Because it takes all your lifetime of gaining the skill to get to the point where you can begin it. And all that observation and all of that, um, like, like you mentioned, learning along, getting, learning, 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 until you're ready to tackle something like that. Which is why it made this project so intimidating, because it was going to be documented <laughs> for, you know, for both. And every stroke, there was a click, stroke, click, you know, for this time last year. And um, it was... Uh, you know, it was, it was so so worth it now seeing this, but really, um, I, I go out there to just gather information, not to have it be a final product, it's just to learn and grow. Um, and they may never, they might be on the cutting room floor. Yes, she said, Catherine said to us, she, 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 she was nervous when we headed out, because it's hard to gather up the filmmakers and the time and the staff members, and. Carrie and Grace were with me when we were up there with Catherine. We had two, three, four, six, five people, I think. Usually it's just my chocolate lab. <laughs> and, oh, and the dog. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, like she said, it's, it, you never know. So she, one of her comments to us was, oh, I hope it's not a scraper, meaning you scrape <laughs> the paint off and you just start all over After again. In two hours, you can just... <laughs> but it, you know, fortunately it was not a scraper, and she agreed that it was, it wasn't her favorite painting, of course, she's ever done, but she agreed that it was good enough for our purposes, what we're trying to achieve here, and we're really happy to have that, so thank you so much for your time devoted to that project. You've donated so much time to us, and I want to also thank Carrie Schwartz, because she did all the really complicated technology behind what you see happen here. I never could have taken that on myself. Um, curatorial, a whole team of people working, and it, you know, it truly is an exciting time for all of us to see all of this work from the artists and from the staff members and the volunteers coming together. So thanks for joining us. I want to remind you that we always have a special deal in the cafe, in the Rising Sage Cafe, after these programs. If you go into the cafe and you tell them you just attended the program in the galleries, they will give you a 20% discount on your lunch. So thanks for coming and come again.